Hello friends, you are watching 3AB and Sabbath School panel and we are so excited each and every week that our viewers all around the world continue to stay with us. We do this for you uh, and not just for you, we do it for us too because we love to study God's word. Uh, but this week we are making our way obviously through our study on the book of Ephesians and we're in week number three, lesson number three, entitled The Power of the Exalted Jesus and just two lessons into this, I've been tremendously blessed so far. It's just saturated with the message of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. And we're going to continue on that theme. Before we go any further, though, I would like to introduce our panel members. To my direct left is Ms. Shelley Quinn. It is a blessing to be here. My lesson is experiencing insight from the Holy Spirit. Amen. And of course, to your left is Pastor John Lomacain. Mine is participating in resurrection power. What a beautiful topic. Amen. Looking Absolutely. forward to it. Sure. And of course, to your left is doctor. I call you doctor because you're, a, you're like a surgeon when it comes to the Word of God. Very precise and always enjoy uh, the encouraging word that you bring to us, Daniel Parent. Thank you, Ryan. I have Christ above all powers. Amen. Praise the Lord. And last but not least... <laughs> Pastor James Rafferty, always a blessing to have you join us. Always good to be here. I have the power of the exalted Jesus, which is Thursday's lesson. Amen. Oh, no, excuse me. Jesus, all things, and his church, which is Thursday's gotcha. lesson. Gotcha. Okay. Praise the Lord for that. As always, we thank you so much for joining us here on the 3 and Sabbath School panel. We've got lots to cover, but before we get into this most important subject of exalting Jesus, I'm going to ask Miss Shelley Quinn if she don't mind to have an opening prayer for us. I would love to. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus to praise you, to thank you, to say we love you. How we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and the gift of your Word. Lord, there is rich, there's a richness in Ephesians that we mm -hmm. ask you would help us to mm -hmm. translate now. Send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Our memory text comes from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 19, verses 19 and 20. And I'll actually read those right now. It's, it says here, through the Holy Spirit, believers may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which worked in Christ, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Uh, just a beautiful message indeed. And the lesson brings out an uh, interesting story, some interesting statistics that I did not know about. Uh, and it says here, human beings, it seems, are always reaching for more power. Isn't that the truth? Hmm. Auto manufacturer, auto, auto manufacturer Devil Motors, for example, showed off the prototype of his Devil 16, a vehicle with a 16-cylinder, 12.3-liter engine producing more than 5,000 horsepower. Have mercy. Mm. Uh, or it says, if that is not enough, consider the Peterbilt semi-truck that sports three Pratt & Whitney J34 or 48 jet engines boasting 36 thousand horsepower the truck does a quarter mile in 6.5 seconds and regularly hits 376 miles per hour before deploying its two parachutes that's a lot of power mm. wow. in contrast though Paul prays that believers in Ephesus under temptation to admire the various powers and deities of their culture will experience through the Holy Spirit the immensity of the power God makes available to them in Christ. The divine might is not measured in horsepower or magic, but is seen in four cosmos-shifting salvation history events. And it lists those four events. The first one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, his ex exaltation at the throne of God. Number three, all things being placed in subservience to Christ. And number four, Christ being given to the church as its head. And of course, we read about this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to verse 23. And of course, it says, in considering these four events, believers may begin to grasp and experience the vast scope of the power God exercises 
exercises on their behalf. And of course, that sets us up for Sunday's lesson, which is entitled Praying and Thanksgiving. Now, this is powerful because when you study through the book of Ephesians, and of course, this is in, you could see this in, in much of Paul's writings and other books, but especially in Ephesians, you can see that uh, Paul is very much often motivated to pray for the church, as we should be motivated to pray for each other often. But not just any kind of prayer, always just seeking to ask for things, but praying in thanksgiving, praying and thanking God for his power and what he is doing through his church. In fact, it gives us a couple of examples right here in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23, which we're going to read by the way, and then also Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 21. Probably won't read both of these, but I do want to go to Ephesians chapter 1 and read, actually let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and let's read verses 14 to 21. Ephesians 3 verses 14 to 21. And notice what the Bible says here. It says, for this reason, this is Paul praying, he says, for this reason I bow my, I bow my knees to the Father, O our Lord Jesus Christ, or of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is this is a perfect example. Of course, you can read another one of these in Ephesians 1, as I referenced earlier, verses 15 to 23. Paul praying earnestly for the people, but not just prayers of, Lord, do this for them and this for them and this for them and this for them, as those are important, as God does here, as the Bible says, our petitions that are brought before him on behalf of each other. If we ask that which is of the will of God, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that he hears us and he, he will answer. But in, in, in most cases, you know, we need to be taught and we need to learn how to pray and give thanks to God in prayer and give and offer up prayers of thanksgiving for what he is doing in our lives, what he is doing in the church. And that's what Paul is exemplifying here on more than one occasion here in the book of Ephesians as he's recognizing that God, you're doing a mighty work in, in your people's lives. And he's encouraging the church. He's saying, look what God is doing in you. Look how, look how God is transforming the church and he's uplifting you and he's brought you into the knowledge of his love and, 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 and in faith and in his mercy. In fact, it's interesting that when you go on to, uh, I'm going to read three verses here that's, that you see that Paul does this uh, in, in multiple other books as well. In Ephesians, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Did you catch that? When you uplift a prayer for your brothers and sisters, when you say a prayer for your pastors, when you say a prayer for the church, uh, for your family, members or whoever it is, do you in all of your prayers pray making requests for them with joy to the Lord because you're thankful, you're excited, you're happy of what God is doing in your life. And you know, I've heard people say oftentimes, well, nothing good has happened in my life. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, yes, we go through trials, we go through tribulations and we know that there's those tough things that bring us down, but you know, God is there and God is with you. And I know if you just focus in and think about it, you can see many blessings that God has blessed you with. And there's always an opportunity to lift up a prayer of thanksgiving to God. First Thessalonians chapter one and verse two, Paul again says, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. So mm. praising God and giving thanks to him for the church and what he's doing in the church. Also, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. And I love this text. We've read it many times. Uh, the beautiful counsel that comes from Paul here. He says, rejoice always. Do you do enough rejoicing? Mm -hmm. Do we do enough rejoicing in our prayers, my friends? Do we stop? You know, I, I have made it a... Uh, I've made it, uh, again, not uplifting myself here because I certainly can learn how to pray more and pray better, but I have made it a habit that when I, when, I, when I address the Lord and I go to the Lord in prayer, I'm not quick to you know, say, Lord, you know, I have this problem and this problem and I need you here and I need this fixed and I need this. I always go to the Lord and try to humble myself and say, God, you're so good. You, you are so wonderful and praise him and spend a few moments just uplifting him in a joyful, exalting way because he is worthy and he hears us and he is our 
our God of salvation and he is worthy Amen. to receive that. So I love how Paul says in verse 16, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, mm. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, two words, rejoice always. Mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Rejoice always. And then of course, verse 17 and onward, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And of course, the lesson brings out that this isn't talking about, you know, when it says pray without ceasing, many people take that so literally and they think that, you know, you have to remain on your knees constantly all the time in prayer. But rather, this is, this is talking about uh, th that, you know, we move through life with hearts open to the presence and the power of God, seeking cues for thanksgiving to Him. It means a readiness to process the issues of life in the presence of God to seek divine counsel as we experience the twists and turns that life begins. So being, being always in constant connection with the Lord and always in constant communion with Him, whether it's in small prayers throughout the day or just simply being in a worshipful attitude towards Him, you are praying, you are exalting, you are living for Christ without ceasing. And that's the purpose of that message there. You know, I did an anointing recently. It was my very first ever anointing. I was visiting a church. They didn't have a pastor. They didn't even have a head elder. And, and they called me and they said, could you, we have a lady that has cancer. Could you, could you carry on out an anointing? Well, I didn't even feel comfortable at first. I thought, I'm not a pastor. I'm, I'm not a head elder. I am an elder, but I, I, I just, I, if there's a head elder there or someone that could do that, I would feel much better. And they said, we don't have any of that. And, and we're hoping that you can step up and lead out because we've never done this. Well, I've been a part of these anointings, but I, I remember this lady who had cancer. We were praying for her. We went through the whole outline. We went through this beautiful moment. But as we were praying, you know, I just, again, was encouraged to, before I went right into this prayer and, you know, Lord, this lady's struggling with this. And, you know, God already knows. He already knows this. But yet I, we, we started with the prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you for this sister's life. Thank you for what you've done in her life. Thank you, Lord, for what you are going to do in her life. And we just took a moment in the beginning to exalt him because right. he is worthy. We're talking about prayer pr of, of praise and thanksgiving. The title of this lesson again, praying in uh, this Sunday's lesson, praying and thanksgiving. Those two things go, oh, go together well and they should. And as I was, of course, studying for this lesson and, and looking into all of its multiple aspects that we don't have time enough to go through, of course, the great song popped in my head. I always mm -hmm. think of great is thy faithfulness. It's just one of my favorite hymns and the message of it is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. If you don't know how to pray, sing mm -hmm. it. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, dear Lord, unto me. Mm -hmm. Sing it, pray it, live it because he is worthy. Jesus will be exalted, if not by you, by the rocks. So you are a living being and he is worthy to be praised and exalted. So next time you offer up a prayer, start it with, Lord, you are worthy. Thank you, Lord. With joy and exaltation, lift up your king today. Go ahead, Shelley. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, for that rousing beginning. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Monday's lesson experiencing insight from the Holy Spirit. We're going to focus on Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. I want to back up first though, because in Ephesians 1, 13, Paul has already said that the Holy Spirit is given at the time of conversion. Let's read that. In Him you also trusted, Ephesians 1, 13. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So now what Paul is saying, you have the Holy Spirit. He wants the Holy Spirit to give us divine insight into give us a deeper understanding of who the person of Jesus Christ is, mm -hmm. his inheritance in the saints, and understanding the power that's available to all of us, along with the wisdom to apply God's instructions in our lives so that we can enjoy what he's given to us. That's right. So, we're going to take this apart. Hopefully we'll have time to go back and put it all together, but I'm just going to take it apart verse by verse. Ephesians 1, 16. This is Paul praying. And by the way, if you don't know how to pray for your family that may not be saved, pray Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. Paul begins in Ephesians 1, 16. 
I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Paul suffered so many problems, trials, and tribulations. We don't always think of him as a joyous Christian, but he was a very joyous Christian. And his constant habit was to pray for the saints, to pray for their spiritual development. So when you were talking about praying without ceasing, I consider that practicing the presence of God. Mm -hmm. I pray and say, Lord, give me a divine awareness of your presence. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the day, what you find yourself doing, it doesn't have to be on your knees. I'm sure Paul just said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He he was talking with the Lord all the time Mm -hmm. because he was very aware of his presence. So verse 17, for I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. I have to say this that God is the Father of His covenant Son of Jesus Christ does not indicate that Jesus is subordinate in power or position. It is a covenant term, God the Father. Jesus was equal to the Father. He said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And He prayed before his crucifixion. He prayed, now, Lord, glorify me, John 17, 5. So continuing in Ephesians 1, 17, he's praying that God would grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, insight into the mysteries of the gospel, in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. A spirit of wisdom here could mean an illuminated human mind, or it could be the Holy Spirit. But wisdom is a heart that applies knowledge. That's right. Because that's important. When spiritual truths are revealed to us and we have instructions from the Word, that's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is in applying them. The spirit of revelation is the ability to understand God's will to us through a revelation of himself. You know what? Mm -hmm. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. When we really see the Lord revealed, we are inspired and motivated Mm -hmm. to walk in obedience by love. But God's words are spiritual words. They are spiritually discerned. We cannot understand the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. John 14, Mm -hmm. 26, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He brings us into remembrance of all things. So what I want to encourage you at home, I try to remember this every time I open the Bible, is I pray for the Holy Spirit to lead me because you can start studying and think, aha, I've got something here. And when you may be misinterpreting it unless the Holy Spirit is leading. So what he does is he floods our heart with the light of God. And that is the the representative of the truth. So, you know, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 8, we are to have an experience of progressive revelation. We are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in John 17, 3, he's praying. He said, this is eternal life, Father, that they would know you and the one whom you sent. This isn't mental ascension. This isn't knowledge merely because even the demons believe and tremble, right. right? So what he's saying is an experiential knowledge, mm-hmm. knowledge that is, is developed as we live in relationship with him. He continues in verse 18, Ephesians 1, 18. So illuminate your mind, increase your revelation by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. The heart is the inner man. God wants to speak to us through the study of his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he illuminates these truths so that he can call us out of darkness and into his light. 
when he says the eyes of your understanding, we, we get insight into God's plan of love. I guarantee you, if you ever really understand God's everlasting covenant, if you understand all that God has done to save us, He paid the penalty for our sin, but He's also saving us from the power of sin mm -hmm. through the sanctification process. And then He's got this wonderful future glory for us that's so amazing. It will change how you react to Him, how you respond to Him, how you live your lives. So it goes on, and He's saying that your eyes uh, would be, of your heart would be flooded with light. He continues in Ephesians 1:18, so that you can know and understand the hope to which He has called you, and how rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints. Understand the hope of His calling. Did you know when man sinned, when humanity sinned, righteousness, we lost our spiritual innocence. Once you've lost that spiritual innocence, there's nothing that you can do, nothing that you can do to restore it on your own. God's plan of salvation has always been righteousness by faith. and. What He does is the Holy Spirit helps us to understand our life in Christ, our life through Christ, mm -hmm. our life for Christ, right. and our life with Christ. Mm -hmm. To understand that by His power working in us to will and to do His good pleasure, God intends, as Philippians 1, 6 says, to complete the good work that He has begun in us. I think you touched on this last week when it talks about how rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints. We have an inheritance that we have obtained mm -hmm. through Christ, but we are also God's inheritance. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the ringing proclamation of the everlasting gospel throughout the Old and the New Testament. God is saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. I pray and I say, oh, Father, I thank you that you are mine and I am yours. I pray that almost every day because it helps me realize not only do I have an inheritance in him, but I am his inheritance. Deuteronomy 9, 29 says, they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. And I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, my friends, we're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the 3AB and Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it over to Pastor John Loma King for Tuesday's lesson. And mine is entitled Participating in Resurrection Power. And uh, this is an amazing topic, as all of Ephesians is. So I'm going to begin with a verse, uh, verses 20 and to 23 in Ephesians chapter 1. And if I'm following carefully, some of us overlap. Mm. So we'll just continue to squeeze this orange until there's no more spiritual <laughs> content left. But let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20. And we're talking about resurrection power. You know, many people celebrate the resurrection, but how many people celebrate resurrection power? Uh, so many people focus on, wow, uh, resurrection weekend, resurrection week, resurrection day. But there's something more powerful than the event itself is the life that it identifies with. It's the power that has been provided because of the resurrection of Christ. It doesn't get us excited about an event coming and passing, 
but a life that continues to get better and better by the day. That's mm -hmm. what the focus is, not just the event. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets excited about the event. So it's a selling point in the stores and on television and all over the world, Easter, Easter, the resurrection of Christ. But how many Christians get excited about the resurrected life? Mm -hmm. That's what Paul the Apostle talks about. Look at verses 20 to 23. He says, which he worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead, which God worked in Christ, when God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, mm. far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the promise that was fulfilled that Jesus participated and received as a result of his resurrection is also going to, pass on, going to be passed on to us, to those who overcome, I will grant with you to sit with me on my throne. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. So we receive that, but you know, I want to bring out some of the imagery that's that's pointed out in these verses. Now we know that right now we're not sitting in heavenly places, but when you read the Apostle Paul's writing, faith is the bridge between the promise and the fulfillment. But he's saying that we don't have to wait till the fulfillment to know that by faith we are already there. Mm -hmm. Look at Philippians 3 and verse 20. The imagery sits us there by faith, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, mm. the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important to me? Yes. My wife and I have traveled more than 60 countries, but no matter where we go, our citizenship is still here. That's right. Our bodies may be there, but our citizenship has not been removed. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about my wife, and, and I use this factor, she was a citizen of, of England, of the, of the United Kingdom, but then she made a decision to have her citizenship moved to America. So. She still says, I'm an English girl, mm -hmm. but she chose for her citizenship to be someplace else. Mm -hmm. Here we are. We are earthly human beings, corruptible, mortal, but our citizenship by faith is in heavenly places. That's going to be followed by the actuality. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice the promise one day being replaced by the fulfillment. Mm. We have the promise that we're going to be there. And in one of our lessons, we were told that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as guarantee yes. that we will be one day sitting in heavenly places. And I don't know, it could just be me, but I doubt it. I can't wait till that day comes Amen. and we're done sitting down here Amen. and we begin sitting up there. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two, verse six. Now the other factor is we are, we are there by faith, but Paul continues in Ephesians chapter two and verse six. And it says, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So he's not talking about being alone. Hmm but he's talking about the unity of the believer. We could sit together with Christ in heavenly places. So the kingdom is not just mine, the kingdom is ours. Those of us who by faith trust in Christ, by faith walk in Christ, by faith embrace, and I like, I like Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9, and not too many verses from this, that's the whole gift of salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith. That faith enables us to know that it brings with us not only the package of changing our lives, but one day changing our location, sitting in heavenly places. Then we find also Revelation 3.21. I, I quoted this, but here's where it comes from. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and mm. sat down with my father yes. on his throne. That is the overcoming promise. Amen. One day, because of citizenship, our citizenship being in heaven, we being sons and daughters of God, one day we will get a chance to sit down. And um, you guys don't see it, but we all have cushions. You know, we won't need a cushion. <laughs> we won't need a cushion in heaven. God, the, the Lord Jesus is going to know exactly how we like our seat. And I tell you, I don't care if I'm in the first row 
or the 15th row. I could be in the ceiling or on the floor. I'm going to be glad that I'm in that kingdom. Amen. Amen. It's going to be a beautiful experience. Also, the promise. I'm going to read this in the NIV version also. And you've heard this. I could quote it in the King James and the New King James, but I want you to hear it a little differently. John 14, verse 1 to 3, the promise, because the message of Ephesians talks about the fulfillment of that promise, that promise of citizenship. And then I have four takeaways. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Now, the reason I like that rooms is because it's going back to the time of the preparation of the bride. There was also a, a, bride, a room where the bride was being prepared to wait there for her, for her husband man. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily a mansion, but it was more beautiful than anything she had embraced before. And the Bible uses the word dwelling place. This is really what the word is in the Greek, a dwelling place. That dwelling place will be with me and my father in his kingdom. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. So that's the promise. As citizens of the kingdom, we are there in citizenship. We are there by faith but one day we will be there in actuality. Now, what is it all based on? It's all based on the resurrected power. It's all based on the fact that Christ rose and because he rose, we know that he now sits there. When we rise, we will sit in the very same place. But there was always a dispute about the resurrection, whether or not it was a reality. And 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14 and 17 focuses on the fact that it's not a fairy tale. It's not a folklore. It's a reality. And I love this. He says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14, if, if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Some other translations say futile or in vain. But verse 17 says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If your preaching does not include the resurrecting power of Christ, it's futile. It's in vain. Yes. That's why when Paul was failed so much with the Greeks in the combat of philosophy, he said, look, I don't want to know anything else but Christ and him crucified. That's where the power is. I've said to people and, and it's been I've been changing as I've get, gotten older, you know, being in the ministry and pastoring for more than three decades, it gets to the point where you say, okay, what have I not preached about? I've done the prophecy. <laughs> I've done revelation. I've done Daniel. I've done issues. You know, we all going to, I've done the, the health and I've done the, you know, the clean diets and the, all the different things. And as I get older, I realize I could have all that, but not have Christ. And I'll just be a Amen. lost Christian, Amen. highly informed, lost person. Amen. But when you get Christ first, Christ and him crucified, it's a guarantee that will not disappoint. The resurrection of Jesus is a guarantee that the believer will be raised. The resurrection of Jesus is an affirmation that our faith is valid. The resurrection of Jesus is a verification that we are forgiven of our sins. So four points about the resurrected power very quickly. The resurrected power brings a new life. Romans 6 verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. That's the resurrected life. It's also a confirmation that we can be victorious over the power of sin. Re Romans 6 verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And then we have the third affirmation, which is a part of the resurrected life, fellowship with Christ. Philippians 3, verse 10 and 11, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection Amen. and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And finally, that eternal victory over death is a gift of his resurrected life. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Yes. That's yeah. the promise of the resurrection. Amen. All right, let's keep on going with the resurrection here. Yes. I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Wednesday's lesson, Christ above all powers. Mm -hmm. Now in my family, we were reading the book of Ephesians for family worship about a month ago and my children noticed Paul has long sentences. <laughs> and I'm, I'm taking verses 20 and 21, which is right in the middle of one of those long sentences. And if you've got a hard time with long sentences, think about it this way. 
Paul just enjoyed it so much he couldn't get himself to stop talking about it. <laughs> All right, so before we get to verse 20, let's go to the last three words of verse 19. His mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. Mm. All right, you can see where I'm going, all the ands there. Lucifer, the enemy, exalted himself. Jesus humbled himself, even to the point of death, appearing to be conquered so that he could be exalted, being raised from the dead to receive all authority. And Paul simply repeats what is clearly demonstrated in the Gospels, Jesus has all authority. Amen. He says so. He says, I am he who lives. This is what Jesus says in Revelation 1, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus was seated then uh, at the right hand of the Father, where he belongs, and he's in the heavenly places. And I love how that phrase appears here throughout Ephesians, chapter one, verse three, blessings are received from heavenly places by Jesus' authority. We are seated in chapter two, verse six, in heavenly places by Jesus' authority. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, verse 10, the wisdom of God is made known by the church to principalities and powers in heavenly places. We're participating with what Jesus gives authority to do. And chapter 6, verse 12, a conflict is still raging and we are fighting against principalities and powers and forces of darkness in heavenly places. But we're not fighting alone because Jesus is already seated there in heavenly places. And being seated is not inactivity. It is full authority and a certain victory. There is nothing, not a single thing over which Jesus does not have dominion. Not a a single power, not a force, not any so-called God or goddess or spirit or demon or conspiracy of powers or multinational conglomeration of leaders, no secret society, supernatural force, mm -hmm. the list could go on. No temptation is not under Jesus's dominion. Not that he leads or is in charge of these things, but his dominion means they are already conquered. Mm -hmm. And so we are not fighting a losing battle. Daniel chapter 12, uh, sorry, chapter 7, verse 12, he sees this when he writes, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. In other words, there is still a period where fighting goes on, spiritual conflict, but we already know the battle is won. Victory is complete. Yesterday, I was cutting up some logs uh, for our fireplace and my youngest daughter was there with me and I said of a, a, a big round one, go ahead, pick that up and put it in the trailer. And she said, if you help me, all right. And I said, can you do it? She's like, yes. And I helped her, I picked it up and I said, let's do this together. And once we got in the trailer, I said, did you do it? Cause you helped me. All right, and that's what this is all about. You and I can be victorious because Jesus already has been. And this is why Jesus can say so confidently to, to Peter and the disciples there in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail mm. against it. And the believers in Ephesus who received this letter, they'd seen that, all right? Acts 19 tells us about Paul's ministry there. Uh, verse 11 of Acts 19 says they'd seen unusual miracles. And Paul, you know, with, with the power of God, had cast out demons and others who tried to do that could not do it on their own. Acts 19, 19, I love this. Also, many who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow. Uh, if that was was the Greek drachma. It was equal to about a day's wage for a common laborer. If, considering 260 working days a year, 50,000 pieces of silver would be 192 years of labor for wow. life's wages. Oh, so wow. suffice it to say, they were of considerable value. And these people said, uh, the Lord has conquered all these things. We are gonna participate in their destruction. 
Mm. We're, we're going to be a part of the removal of these things that are already conquered. And here's the problem with so many of us, that we hold on to things mm. that are already conquered, wow. that we should be letting go mm. of. God, you've taken care of this. This has no power. All right, mm. sometimes it's things we read, things we watch, habits that we have that, uh, that Jesus says, I have been victorious over temptation, so I can help you. I can help you be victorious as well. Amen. So what has Jesus conquered? Paul could have said he's conquered all, wit, all wickedness, but he gives us a list of five things. I'm going to try to race through them. All right. No angle is not covered. All principalities. Arche is the Greek word, meaning first active cause, the beginning or the origin, things that claim superiority. And this is the enemy who says, I own this city. I built this place. I'm in charge of your life, your long time habits. All right. I've had you since birth. Mm. And uh, God says, Jesus has already accomplished that. He's already been victorious. Amen. Power is exousia, authority or influence, privilege or superiority. Something that tries to control the way you think. I'm better than you. I know more than you. I can influence you. And our enemy certainly is trying to influence in the world today. Might is the word dunamis, strength and ability, power of armies and forces. And I'm going to force you and bully you. If you follow Christ, you will pay. I'm going to take things from you. Fortunately, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Right. It is the dunamis of salvation. All right. It, that's where we get the word dynamite. It will change the landscape of your life. Amen. All right. Satan tries to do that. He says, I, I, can, I can force you to submit to my temptation. No, you can't make me because Jesus has already been victorious. That's right. And then dominion, choriatus, lordship or dominion. I own you. All right. You have to serve me. All right. The servant simply gives allegiance to the master because they're the one in charge. The enemy doesn't have any power over the Lord of Lords who has already conquered. Think of that resurrection over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then every name that is named. For the Ephesians, naming names was a big deal in their magic books involving spiritualism and invoking the names of gods and powers. And we may not think we're doing the same thing today, but a lot of our, our media culture is giving homage to some of those same gods. We're worshiping them today. And you might say, I don't have demonic magic books. I'm not casting spells, spiritualism, no magical names in my home. But these principalities and powers and might and dominion is not just what we might think think of as demonism. All right, this is not just theological concepts that are overthrown. This is not just a web of, uh, of linguistic connections we're making, not clever ideas, not just game pieces that are moved around that get put back into the box. This really literally does mean something for you and me because all of these, these dominion, might, power, principalities are aimed to do something in your life and that is temptation. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I have conquered temptation, so you can too. Right. All the powers of darkness are, and I'm using this word right here, hell bent yes. on your destruction right. and mine. And so the enemy suits his temptations to each person. Temptations of appetite. What is it that they're weak for? What is it that they like? And when those things are presented to us, mm -hmm. as often as we spend time thinking of the resurrection power of Jesus, we can say already conquered. Mm -hmm. That Amen. temptation, because right. temptation itself is not sin. A thought comes to your mind and you say, oh, I'm, I'm such an awful, you know, because that thought came to my mind. That thought is the temptation and it gives you the opportunity to say, Lord, you have overcome that. I'm not going to dwell upon it. You're the one with the power. You're the one with the victory, but I'm going to put forth the action that you empower within me. That's right. All right. There's temptations in the area of selfishness. Mm. If you've got a family, uh, you've got selfishness and <laughs> temptations. All right, we know that. All right, temptations in honesty. Uh, the, the, the enemy would love for us to see the truth as something that can be bent, something that can be set aside in just a small way, not an enormous way, just a, a little way. And it's that little way that begins to twist our character mm -hmm. to become more like his and less like Jesus. Uh, I know that uh, the enemy tempts us in the area of media and consumption, consumption of the things that go into our mind. You sit down in front of that device and already temptation is before you and God is inviting you to to say, put that aside, put me first, Amen. right? Have you ever been in a losing battle? You're not in one, 
when we deal with this, all right? Not only in this age, but in the age to come. Jesus has, has conquered. It's so good to meditate on that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I love that. I love that, that uh, emphasis there, you know, that Paul just couldn't stop talking mm -hmm. about it. And as you yeah. said, uh, Pastor John, you know, that, that in all of our ministry, you know, to put Christ first, mm -hmm. Christ and Him crucified. And then that whole thing about Shelley, we love Him, because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. And that's why, uh, as you said, Ryan, we can rejoice mm -hmm. first and foremost. And it seems like that's what Paul is doing in Ephesians. It seems like he just can't stop talking about right. Christ first mm -hmm. and right. the love of God that causes us to just rejoice evermore. I'm James Rafferty. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled Jesus, All Things and His Church. And I have um, been given the verse in Ephesians chapter 1, Two verses actually in this lesson for Thursday. Thursday's lesson covers verses 22 and 23. We've touched on them. Let's just read them again. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And as Pastor John was saying so clearly, we are in Christ. Christ is the head. All things have been put under Christ and we're his body. Mm. So all things have been put under us in that context. That's what the, the message that Paul is trying to communicate here. The quarterly says, Note carefully that having put, in, put all things under his Jesus' feet, the Father gave him as the head over all things to the church. Right. Compare this, it goes on to say, Compare gave him to be head over all things to the church. That's the New King James Version. While all things is a universal inclusive term, Paul still has in mind the powers mentioned in Ephesians 1.21. Mm -hmm. All things, the cosmic supernatural, the spiritual powers included are all under Christ. They're all subservient to mm -hmm. Him and we are the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's incredible when you think about that. And so we look at this in relationship, for example, to Ephesians 6, which we haven't gotten to yet. And the same point is being made there. Paul is going to move through the book of Ephesians. He's, he's making this introduction and he's going to come to the same point of conclusion. But he's going to prove now in between the connection that the church has to Christ so that we can put on the armor of God and actually have all power subservient to Christ, whose body we are. It's powerful. Principalities, powers, the same Greek words uh, are used literally in relationship in Ephesians 6 to the devil and his angels. You know, this is not a battle that we are equipped for without Jesus. And that's Paul's point. That's the reason why each one of us has been emphasizing Christ and his love because there's no way we're going to get to the end of Ephesians and be able to handle what we have to face mm. without being body of Christ, that's the right. body of Christ. It's a battle that Jesus has won. It's a battle that calls us to focus on Jesus Christ. We are His body. Christ is the head. This is our destiny. This is our predestiny or predestination in Christ. So the quarterly asks, what benefits does the exaltation of Christ to the throne of the cosmos and His rule over all things in heaven and on earth provide for His church? And then it quotes Ephesians chapters 1 verses 22 and 23. And basically the, the, the thought I got out of it, well there were three points I got out of it. First of all, the church is the body of Christ. And I just really want to emphasize that again and again and again. The church is the body of Christ. Whatever Christ has accomplished, whatever Christ has, whatever He he, he is pictured as being in charge of or controlling or being power over. We are his body. So we're connected to him in that way. Christ is the head over all things. We can't forget that. Sometimes we think about everything Christ has accomplished. We say, yes, that's ours because we're his body. And all of a sudden we get start moving up the body and we start moving into the head area. Mm. We can never mm. move into the head area. Right. Christ is the head. He'll always be the head. And then it says Christ is far above all things. And of course, we are his body, mm -hmm. far above all things. And as has been said already, sometimes we settle down in the earth too comfortably. And we don't realize that Christ is far above all things. That's right. And God wants us to be far above all things. That's right. So God, the quarterly goes on to say, has made Christ victorious over all evil powers. Mm -hmm. The church closely identified with Christ and supplied by Him with all it needs is itself guaranteed victory over the foes. The power of God, it goes on to say in the quarterly, on display in the resurrection and in the exaltation of Christ is, is being displayed over 
every cosmic power and it has been activated for the church. So God has given the victorious Christ to the church, which is so united with him that it is called his body. Then it goes on to ask this question. How can believers know the exalted Christ and experience God's power in our lives? So far, we've been talking about Christ, the head, and we're the body, and we're connected with the body, and we're to sit in heavenly places, and we're to rejoice in Christ. And we're to, but how does that actually, what is the practical application of this? How does it actually happen in our lives? And I love this because when we compare Ephesians chapter 1 with Ephesians chapter 6, we see that Paul specifically directly addresses us to the mechanisms and the strategies by which we can know and experience God's power in our lives. Now, know what? We're not in Ephesians chapter 6 yet, right. so we can't <laughs> jump ahead and do that and, and get into all those mechanisms and strategies. But at the same time, I believe Paul is laying out a more comprehensive strategy right here in Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to say 2 and 3. Right here, Paul is laying out a more com comprehensive strategy for knowing God's power in our lives. When we look at the book of Ephesians as a whole, it's a very interesting epistle. It has something that no other epistle of Paul has. In fact, I don't think any other book of the Bible has this except for maybe the book of Revelation. And that is this. When you get to Ephesians chapter 3, Paul ends this chapter with a word that isn't found in any other of his epistles in the middle of a chapter. And that word is, Amen. Paul goes through Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3. He sums it up by talking about how he wants us to be filled with the fullness of God, to know the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of God's love. And then he says, Amen, as if he's done with the whole message that's is true. if that's the end of it. It's like he's dividing it in half in a sense. And he is because when you look at Ephesians 1 and you look at Ephesians 2 and you look at Ephesians 3, you're going to find as you look here this beautiful plan of salvation. You're going to find this emphasis on the love of God. You're going to find this beautiful uh, call to focus on Christ and sit by faith in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What you're not going to find in these first three chapters is any practical emphasis on something that we have to do other than to connect with Christ and behold what He has already accomplished for us. Mm -hmm. However, when you move into Ephesians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 6, it gets very practical. Yeah. In Ephesians yeah. chapter 5, for example, or 4, for example, you're told how the Christian is to operate within the bounds of the church, within the um, confines of, of rubbing shoulders with other human beings who are fallen and faulty. In, also in Ephesians 4, you find practical uh, uh, counsel on how Christians are to uh, relate to the world and navigate through the licentiousness and the sin and the iniquity of the world. In Ephesians chapter 5, you begin to find really intense uh, uh, strategies of how we're to navigate relationships in the home. How a husband is to love the wife and the wife is to submit to the husband. And I don't know which one's the harder, but what I'm saying for fallen human beings is this is where it gets nitty gritty for us. And, and then Ephesians chapter 6 begins with children relating to their parents in a very godly way and finally talks about servants. And in, in, in other words, the workplace and those who are the boss and those who are subservient to the boss and how that in, in a relationship is to, supposed to take place. So. Paul here is taking Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, which is very practical, and he's separating it by an amen from Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. And the point he is making is powerful. We use it, uh, a simple illustration. We, we say often as Christians, as believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and those who believe that that gospel is powerful enough to sanctify us and to transform us, we say, now don't get the cart before the horse. Mm. Paul in Ephesians is making sure we don't get the cart before the horse. The cart would be the fruits of the gospel, what it looks like in the church, in the world, in the home, in the workplace. And then there's the gospel itself. And you will not find, look, search, scrutinize, you will not find practical. This is what you need to do. 
other than being connected with Jesus in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. It's all about Christ. He's predestined us. He's blessed us. He's, he's forgiven us. He's lifted us up. He's filled us with His Spirit as an earnest. On and on and on. The focus is Christ. And He can't hardly stop Himself. He just, and, 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 and. He just wants to talk about the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of Christ. Why? Because He wants us to be so full of the love of Christ that it bursts out in its practical application in the church and in the world and in the home and in the workplace. It bursts out and then finally he's going to sum it all up and say, now remember I want you to put on the armor of God. I want you to be saturating yourselves with this love that we talked about in the first three chapters. I mentioned the book of Revelation does the same thing. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that's the first place that you find mention of a people who keep the commandments of God. That's because before you can keep God's commandments, you've got to know His love. Jesus says it this way, you'll love me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then John says, we love Him, as Shelley said earlier, because He first loved us. That's the emphasis and the power in the book of Ephesians. Amen. 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 Beautifully put. Great messages, great lesson. Let's go ahead and get some final thoughts. I was just thinking in uh, Ephesians 1, 16 through 19, Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit illuminating our mind and us understanding. It requires some study. We've got to get into the Word. We've got to pray every day for the Holy Spirit. But I didn't finish this verse. Verse 19, he says that you've got this divine understanding that you may know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, surpassing greatness of His power in us who believe in Him. Pray for the Holy Spirit to bring you spiritual insight. Receive His power. Amen. That's right. You know, the resurrected life is not just a new way of believing, but it's the power to live a new way. Yes. Amen. My final thought, I just want to press this promise in one more time to our minds and hearts. His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. There is no other power than the power of the exalted Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much for the powerful lesson today, my friends. And we want to thank you for joining us each and every week. You know, you, you don't want to, sh you know, hold all this goodness in for yourself. Share it with somebody. So tell them to encourage your friends and family to download the 3ABN Plus app. Also go to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel .com. You can access the study, of course, and keep along with us and stay along with us as we're going through. You're not going to want to miss next week because we're going to be diving in to lesson number four, which is an entitled How God Rescues Us. We all need rescuing and we're going to be applying all the emphasis on that lesson next week. So my friends, again, thank you for watching the 3ABN Sabbath School panel and we will see you right back here next week.